Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, you filled the hills of Judea with joy at the wondrous birth of John. Fill us also with joy as we celebrate his birth. May we hear your voice, proclaim the good news of your coming, and do your will. We cry out with Zechariah, Blessed be the Lord God, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Son, the eternal Word, and the radiance of the Father, who before he took flesh and became man, sent John to prepare his way. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Today we sing praise to you, O John, messenger, forerunner, and baptizer, saying, you are the child whose birth was announced by an angel sent by God. You are the voice crying out in the wilderness and the prophet to whom the mystery of the Lord was revealed while still in your mother's womb. You are the covenant linking the two covenants for you brought the old covenant to an end and began the new. You are great among the children of women and you came to tell us of the Most High. You are the sign of God's mercy and an apostle of the King of Peace. You are the star who guides us to the true light coming into the world, and you give light to churches, monasteries, and convents. Now, O prophet of the Most High, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to obtain the miraculous grace of Christ for us, so that our souls may be adorned with good works as we witness to the true faith. With Zachariah, your father, and Elizabeth, your mother, we glorify the Father who sent you. We worship the Son whom you longed to see while you were still in the womb. And we give thanks to the Spirit who sanctified you before you were born. To the most holy Trinity be glory and thanks forever. Lord Jesus, extend your holy right hand upon your faithful people and bless your flock. Accept this incense that we have offered to you on this feast of the birth of John the Forerunner. Make us worthy to praise and glorify you with spiritual hymns and to give thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Kadi Shant Aloha letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written, that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the freeborn woman. And the son of the slave woman was born naturally, the son of the freeborn through a promise. Now this is an allegory. These women represent two covenants. One was from, from Mount Sinai, hearing children, bearing children for slavery. This is Hagar. Hagar represents Sinai, a mountain in Arabia. It corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery along with her children. But the Jerusalem above is freeborn, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, you barren one who bore no children. Break forth and shout, you who were not in labor. For no, more numerous are the children of the deserted one than her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as the child of the flesh persecuted the child of the spirit, it is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not share the inheritance with the son of the freeborn. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are children not of the slave woman, but of the freeborn woman. For freedom, Christ set us free to stand firm. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. 
Praise be to God always. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. Praise, glory, and honor of most holy Trinity. And by my sin, saints, good evening, my son. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent to listen. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, when the time arrived for Elizabeth to have her child, she brought forth a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy toward her, and they rejoiced with her. When they came on the eighth day to circumcise the child, they were going to call him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said in reply, no, he shall be called John. But they answered her, There is no one among your relatives who has this name. So they made signs asking his father what he wished him to be called. And he asked for a tablet, and he wrote, John is his name. And all were amazed. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was freed, and he spoke, blessing God. Then fear came upon all the neighbors, and all these matters were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard these things took them to heart, saying, What then shall this child be? For surely the hand of the Lord is with him. This is the truth, peace be with you. When the time arrived for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You can ask the question, what does it mean to live in an open world or in a closed world? I'm not talking politics, but what it means fundamentally to live in a world which is enclosed or a world which is open. When Adam, when mankind is created by God, if you remember, there are two directives given to God, by God to Adam and Eve. The first is be fruitful and multiply. Be channels of life, bring life into the world. And the second is that they have dominion over creation. 
Now, dominion over creation in the last three centuries has meant exploitation through the Industrial Revolution. But it's not what the text actually means. It's not what the revelation is about. What Adam and Eve had, their dominion, and it's funny for us in English because we use the word Lord. And Lord actually in English is a combination of two Saxon words, Lofwarden, the one who keeps the bread. That's what the word literally means. This is the one who provides for us. This is the one who is over us in that sense. So it's a funny sense in the English, we can look at that. But what it meant is that Adam and Eve knew creation, but they were the ones who offered creation to God as the only conscious, self-realized, intelligent beings amongst all of creation, offering it back to the Creator. So that in the sense of dominion of creation, everything in a sense becomes transparent. Because Adam and Eve didn't fixate on any given creature, but all creatures were seen as being gifts from God to whom God was rendered thanks because of them. And for what the trees and the bunny rabbits and the rocks couldn't do to honor God consciously, mankind was meant to do. That is an open world. It's open because Adam and Eve, through the things that are surrounding them, mankind surrounding them, see them as gifts from above and see them as acts then of gratitude to God and render worship to the Creator for our existence, for everything. That's the notion of dominion in its original thing. So it's why with Pope Francis, with the idea of focusing upon creation and tending it, we're told also in the garden in paradise that mankind is to keep, when Adam is created, to keep and to tend the garden. And the word paradise just means garden, it's just from the Greek. The word means the same. And so that creation was meant to be tended, guarded, and consciously worked on of what God gave, and the dominion is to render thanksgiving. That is an open world, because Adam and Eve are not shackled to any of these creatures. They are oriented in an open way beyond creation to God. So that's one of the things we have to begin by considering how the human race was first created. Now, as I mentioned in the last three centuries, the idea of having dominion over the world has meant exploitation. You find a silver mine, you find a coal vein, you, and so you strip the whole mountain down. That's not what dominion over the world means. But it is the result of what takes place when Adam and Eve choose to close the world. And so when they are proposed the knowledge of good and evil, that's represented as a tree in the scriptures, the knowledge of good and evil is the notion of, it has two possibilities. One is the control of creation, or probably more correctly, the knowledge of good and evil is the juxtaposition of opposites. Like when we do Lord of Lords, the Song of Songs, the notion of the combination of good and evil are the two ends of a spectrum to basically then say that what they are is the knowledge of everything. And so the pursuit of omniscience, to know everything and to think that we can possibly know everything there is to know. But what the Adam and Eve do by making this choice is they turn inwards then toward themselves, and it's about their choices now. It's not about all of creation over which they have dominion that God has given to them of everything. They choose themselves. And so they turn inward. Now the contrast is, is that the first open aspect of creation, the way God creates mankind, is about what we call the priesthood. So in the church we talk about the, the priesthood of the faithful, or the priesthood of the church, the royal priesthood St. Peter talks about in his letters. And that's exactly how mankind is originally. We talk about priesthood, and it's, it's a clumsy word for us in English because priesthood literally means the state of being an elder. But of course, we understand that priesthood means the rendering of things sacred, to set things aside, to recognize them as holy, and that notion of consecration. That's the open creation that God originally creates. So what takes place here is when Adam and Eve turn inward on themselves, 
things are no longer transparent gifts from God to render to God in thanksgiving. Now they're about us and what we get out of them. And that turning inward is completely in a repudiation of what they were given first, and it creates that closed world. It's the foundation of sin. Sin isn't whether we're lying or murdering or whatever it may be. Those are the choices, specific choices made. The foundation of sin is about me. What do I get? What is it to me in these things? So sin is about turning inward. When our Lord comes to preach the kingdom, and St. John the Baptist is the first to announce the kingdom of God, notice the term kingdom, the malko, the malkutho. The kingdom is about dominion. And that preaching again is to break open that world of sin which is focused and closed upon the sinners themselves. Because the sinner is not just simply abusing their free choice and using it in a wrong way. That's true. But sin is not merely that. Remember again, the word sin in Saxon just means mistake. So how does mankind screw up making mistakes all the time? It's because we're thinking first and foremost, not about just misusing our free will or a defective choice, but sin is precisely in the fact that we make and what we love is this world as a goal. The purpose and the finality is about this place, this world, here below. That's the foundation of sin. It's no longer open and transparent and recognizing us coming from the Creator. It's focused upon here below, the finality. And what our Lord does in St. John the Baptist first in his preaching is that the new and truly royal power of the kingdom, which is meant to return to mankind, to the humanity by the Savior, is the ability to transcend and to overcome the finality of this world. And finality, of course, just means that the goal, the end, the purpose of our lives being this world here below. The kingdom is meant to shatter that open because it's not about here. You weren't created to only live here. You're meant to transcend beyond and ultimately return to the fullness of the kingdom, which is the vision of God face to face. So as long as we choose the finality here below, where my life is primarily about getting that retirement home in Florida, or making sure that my 403B account is topped off, then we're, we're losing the understanding, because we're making the finality about this existence, this world, we close it in. Because what it does is the natural limitations of creation necessarily have closed horizons. They lock us into a way of life that is the foundation of the great mistake, which is sin. Things are meant to be transparent. Yes, maybe I will have a retirement home in Florida. Not personally, I would never live there. But it's bad enough, to, it's, it's good for four weeks in January. And the rest of the time, you know, the alligators eat your dogs, the cockroaches are the size of puppies. So, you know, forget it. I don't know what the attraction is anyway. So if we can make fun of it, that's good. But the idea is that we may have those things, but yes, that just is another blessing from God. I have something which is wonderful. I have my beautiful beachfront property, and it's beautiful, and I have it, and I love it, and I understand I have it for a certain time, and my grandchildren will come scurrying to grab it after I kick the bucket. But I'm not attached to it. I'm not locked into it. It is not the purpose of my existence. And quite honestly, if I hadn't arrived at getting that beachfront property, that's okay too. I just get another shovel for staying in Maine and I'm okay. We see them as being blessings when we have them, they are wonderful. If we don't have them, well, shucks. But it's not the purpose of my existence. And we've known people in our lives for whom things and attitudes and affluence and things of this world are their finality. They're their goals. They're their purpose in life. And that's the world which is closed in. 
It's the world that we have to some extent with Zachary on the day that Gabriel announces to him that your old wife is going to have, you an old man are going to have a baby. Well, of course, as far as nature is concerned, as far as this world is concerned, that's just simply nutty. It's nuts, it's no way. And so he's made mute for those nine months before the child is born that we commemorate today. But what's important to understand is that Zechariah is not being punished because he sinned. If you read the prayers in the Husoyo, in our liturgy, it says that God made him mute to open his heart to his grace. That the purpose of his muteness was not a punishment or an affliction because he had made the wrong choice or his reasoning was too locked into this world but it was so that his reasoning would become fully liberated and become truly human, that God works within this creation and open up that world so that the power of the kingdom is the constant ability given to the children of God to reject the world as an enclosed end, as a sole purpose. It's not rejecting the world as creation, of course. That's beautiful and it's blessing. But to reject it as the reason for my existence as something which is enclosed, that's what the kingdom shatters open. That's what the kingdom transforms in the preaching. So that it makes, what happens when the person lives in enclosed religion, it encompasses everything. When they live in those enclosed horizons, excuse me because everything becomes subordinated to this world's finality then, including God, faith, and religion. This is the individual who lives their life where religion's there, it's kind of nice, when it's convenient or when it fits in. You know it, in a couple weeks' time, the church will fill up with people who come once a year because it's nice to have a church ceremony for the winter holidays. It, it doesn't really have anything to do with God. It has to do with God being subordinated with the celebration of the winter holiday. It's a way that we look at things and see things, and so that even God gets locked into what is essentially a consumer mentality. And when I say consumer mentality, I don't mean we go shopping all the time. I mean, that's what it usually means nowadays. But consumer means just that. I live to consume. I live to take things in. What do I get? How much is here? What is actually in it for me? <clears throat> That's the consumer mentality. And when an individual sees the world as being closed and that their purpose is this world, then everything, including God and religion and faith, are all subordinated for consumption. So if they like it and feel good, then they support. If they don't, they come. They don't come, whatever. And this is how slippery the slope of sin is. <clears throat> it's not about that we're mass murderers or huge extortionists. Sin means we make mistakes in the human choices of our lives. That's all the word means. Sometimes our choices are big mistakes, sometimes they're small mistakes, but the mistake is still the foundation and the fundament is, is only seeing this world. Which is why, <clears throat> when we come, why we celebrate this birth of John the Baptist. We only commemorate three birthdays into this world. John the Baptist, of course, our divine Lord on Christmas, and the Nativity of Our Lady on September 8th. So today we have the coincidence of John's birth and the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God. <clears throat> and of course then, nine months later, we're going to celebrate her nativity, her birth, on September 8th. Now why do these three stand out? Why do we celebrate? Because of course, when we celebrate somebody's birthday, it means their death the day that they enter into the fullness of the kingdom. When you read the martyrologies of the Synaxarion, our listing of the saints, the date you give for their birth is their birth into eternal glory. So why do we celebrate the temporal birth of Mary of Nazareth, our Lord Jesus, and John the Forerunner? These three individuals are the only, from the time of Adam and Eve's creation in union with God and without sin, 
These are the only three people ever to be born into the world who are without stain, without sin. When we commemorated the visitation last week with Our Lady and Elizabeth, the baby jumping around in the womb and leaping, the fathers of the church consider this is the moment filled with the Holy Spirit that this child is cleansed from all the sins of original sin of Adam and Eve. So that when John is born, he's born without sin into this world to be the forerunner of the Messiah. When Mary of Nazareth enters into the world, her birth is also without stain. Her conception, her creation that we commemorate this day is also without blemish, without stain, without any kind of corruption and in union with God in grace and friendship. So that when she's born into the world, she is also born into the world without sin. She is the new Eve, the beginning of the new creation of opening up the world once again to the way that God originally intended to have that transcendent vision. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, this is God himself entering into the world without sin. These are three people who are born in time into a world which begin the shattering open of that limited enclosed finality of this world. That's why we commemorate their birth into this world. For the rest of us, our birth into the world is just the beginning of the countdown to the day of death. We're born into this world, we reach a peak physically, mentally, and we just start falling apart. We know the process, right? And that's really what our birth into the world is about. But these three individuals, it's why we celebrate them. It's why I mentioned to you, I shocked people last year, and I said, Christmas is not about Jesus' birthday. It's not about that. It's about the appearance of sinlessness into the world to recreate for humanity the possibility of opening out so that true religion and true faith, true belief, is this mysterious certitude that the kingdom of God is something which is now and which is something which has always been and shall always be something not of this world. It transcends this world. It's beyond. And everything is to be conformed to that light of the kingdom. This is why the gospel transformed the Western world. It's because of this vision of the kingdom as everything is pulled in. The arts, science, everything, studies, scholarly, everything is to be pulled into this light of the kingdom which is ultimately transcendent and eternal. And this alone is what gives meaning to creation. This alone is what gives meaning and value to everything in this world including human life. Which is why the further we move away from the vision of the gospel of the kingdom, the more confused we become as a people. To the point now we don't even know what is the value of human life. Now we start talking about the quality of life as if we can put people, ranking them on a scale. This person's got a better quality of life, this person's left, this person shouldn't live, this person should live. We're moving in this direction, which is a return to paganism. And it's a great shame because it's a world which closes in and in and in. So we bring all of this up because the preaching of the kingdom that the forerunner brings, that initiates the whole beginning of our Lord's work as the Messiah, is that through the kingdom, everything is made pure again. Everything is made new again by the way that we see it. The vision is restored, which was originally meant to be mankind's, to be humanity's vision, so that we begin to perceive, we begin to experience everything ultimately in God and not in itself. And that's why the house in Florida, if I get it, great. If I don't get it, that's great too. Either way, and then I'm happy for my children to have it. I don't hold it over their heads as a way of saying, well, if you're not good to me, I'm going to change this will and do all of this kind of struggle in human life that we wind up having. The kingdom gives vision and transformation of all. It shatters the limited vision and the closed finality, which is the fundamental reality of sin. So why do we bring all of this up to finish with? It's because on January 12th, when we have our baptismal ceremonies, at the end of the baptism and the chrismation, these boys will be crowned. We put a banding across their forehead. They're also girded around their waist. 
That band is not just because of the chrismation. That banding is a crowning of entering into the kingdom as the children of God, into the new kingdom. That symbolism is when you bring your babies, you normally bring a little headband with them because the headband goes on the baby too. But the ceremony is originally created for adults and you crown them at the end of the ceremony because it is that entrance into the kingdom of a new vision, of a transformation and an opening of the world to make everything new again, to see the world. As we mentioned to you priesthood in the beginning, this is the notion of the priesthood of the church. Not the institutional sacramental priesthood, but the priesthood of the church is that these children of the kingdom who see things new, whose world has been opened up and is no longer closed on, on enclosed horizons and a finality only of this creation, they are able to receive God's blessings, see them, receive them, receive them in gratitude and offer them back to God in holiness. That is the priesthood that allows us to engage in that transformation of vision. That is the priesthood which on January 12th these young men will be initiated into. And this is the priesthood that you already all participate in. The ability to everything that we have, including the shopping and everything you're scurrying around to do now for your Christmas preparations, all of that is a blessing. Even the traffic jams or whatever else, or the cranky lady who's in front of the line at you at the store, they're all blessings if we see them that way in the light of the kingdom. And when we do that, then we understand the final words that are given about the birth of this child, John. Everyone's just amazed. The Father speaks this transformation that takes place. You give him a name which we don't even know where this came from. Nobody in the family has the name. Yohanan means gift of God. Hanan, the word Hannah, and the name means gift. Yahanan means the gift given from Yah, from God. That is John. And everyone's scratching their heads and marveling about this and getting on the phone and texting everyone about what took place in Ayin Karim that day. They all marvel. But what's marvelous about it is not that they're talking about it. That's understandable because this is rather extraordinary. This old lady just had a baby. Okay, that's pretty extraordinary. But their response to it, what shall this child be? And so when we crown on the day of baptism, the question becomes, what do these young men become? Because truly, as they say in the gospel, for surely the hand of the Lord is with them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Lord and Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not to me, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. Thank you. 
for the forgiveness of sins and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Iterot madeb hei da loho valot ar loho dan kali kanyo vaynab zubot aibota geyu lel vaytok vestu lel chayet lo or bo Mighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
We continue on page 876, the Anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we, who have remained in your divine love, be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. from all creation you are peace reconciling those who are enemies you are forgiveness to those who sin and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful open the door of your mercy to our petitions and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only son and his love for all people and through his holy your holy spirit now and forever O oh Lord, you are adored by all angels, bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness. May we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. 
In your mercy, you sent your Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sin with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only Son. Kyrie eleison, vabiamo haudoktom hasho dilema bedchaye. And sabe lachma bidao kodi shanto ubarachu kodesh. Watso ya bel talmidao kodo mara. Sabe khula mehne kul khu. Khono denita fakhro odil. Dahlo faikun wakhlov sagiye. Metakaseo meti hem. Who so young, how be wa hoi nan alam alamin. Hokano alco so damsi woman hamro men mayo. Barahu kades. Ya del talmi tau kado mara sabish tau mene kulhu hono deni tau demahon dilam diati ki khdato dakhlo faikun wahlof sagiyen mete shadu meti hab khusoyon khome wa khayen al alam alamin. Do this in memory of me, each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord, we profess your resurrection, we await your second coming, we implore your mercy and compassion, we ask for the forgiveness of sins, may your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory? Who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin? Who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured? Who can praise your plan of salvation for us? We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us be worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O mighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O Mercy on us and hear us. Our 
awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin morio, manin morio, manin morio, ni te modro ho chayu kadisho, o na chen alai nu aru korbono ho no. This bread, the body of Christ our God, be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the shout of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the Word of Truth, so that they may spread it faithfully, with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will, and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them, to lead the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O oh Lord. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and the distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, and glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this world, altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O oh God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. 
Lord. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one, one Holy Spirit, Spirit. blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. 
Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be the glory forever. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, O lover of all people. Have mercy on us.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls 